Right, good morning, everyone. Um, I was partly delayed because I was stuck behind some historically informed vintage cars that were making a, a very slow journey from the motorway to Huddersfield for some reason. Um, uh, so this, this paper is in two parts. Uh, basically, I'm going to look at the growth of editions of 18th century music in the 19th century. I won't be talking about details of performance practice at this point. It's more a question of publishing and editorial policies. And secondly, I'll look at recordings of that repertoire in the early 20th century, looking at a period roughly up to about 1930. And uh, I promise you will get to listen to some recordings uh, towards the end of this paper, uh, and maybe one earlier on as well. So, uh, a significant proportion of the performing editions of string music produced in the 19th century consisted of repertoire from the previous century. At the time, references from Corelli to Nardini called it old or classical, both high-value terms, not Baroque. Um, Baroque was used pejoratively in 1822 when criticizing a fantasy by Rees. I quote, the harmony and modulation are best described by the French term, une musique baroque. That's not a good thing. Uh, the Athenaeum found Berlioz's Benvenuto Cellini to be baroque, extravagant, and unintelligible in 1838. And even in the early 20th century, the numerous concerts of 17th and 18th century music given by the violinist Frank Thistleton from 1903 onwards, a fascinating series of concerts, well worth uh, a lot more research, um, were consistently reviewed as containing antique, old, or even oldie music. Uh, that was, and these were all quite good things. But in the 19th century, this earlier repertoire was valued because it was a corrective to currently debased taste. Uh, this could involve rejecting ornamentation. The Harmonicon in 1826 said about Tartini, one is surprised and mortified to find a melody abounding in deep feeling overloaded with misplaced finery. It was the besetting sin of the time. The great composers avoided this error by indicating where ornaments should be placed and leaving the selection of them to the taste of the artist. Corelli's music was prized in the 19th century precisely because it was not seen as Baroque, but pure, an example of true art as opposed to the trivial music of the day. Uh, and this quotation from the Revue Gazette Musicale de Paris uh, uh, puts this in very expressive terms indeed. I've highlighted the most important bits. Um, Corelli, uh, in Corelli's time, performers didn't have the least idea of the difficulties of all kinds, which are played and abused so often today. A pure tone, full and even, joined with simple, but to the highest degree expressive phrasing, sufficed to move the listeners whose taste was neither blasé nor perverted, um, uh, unlike, unlike ours. Great quotation. When Henry Holmes translated Spohr in 1878, he added several remarks. He described two opposite schools of solo playing, the modern brilliant and the classic school of Corelli. And he later said that Corelli and Tartini touched the student's sense of the natural, perfect, bold and beautiful as his taste verges into a love of classical art. And Frank Thistleton's concerts were also reviewed in the same terms. The purity, simplicity, and poetry of the old masters, a draught of clear spring water to thirsty lips. Across the noise and clamor of today come these spirit voices from the past. I don't know who Penelope was. I don't know why she was writing for the Derby Daily Telegraph, but uh, she's great. There's a lot more from Penelope about these concerts. Um, they're fantastic. Um, and even in 1923, the cellist Heinrich Grünfeld described the cello's cantilena as incompatible with modern music um, uh, and um, supported this with several 18th century references and not, for example, references to, let's say, Mendelssohn or Schumann. Uh, uh, I won't read you the whole of that, but you get the idea. He says basically that 
because horrible modern music treats the cello so badly, he's had to expand the repertoire by arranging things like Chartini and so forth. I think it's fair to say that most modern historical performances uh, present Corelli in a more virtuosic light. This is his Opus 5, number one. That's uh, Federico Guglielmi playing Corelli's Opus 5, number one, recorded just a few years ago. Uh, it's certainly not a pure corrective to current debased taste, as far as I can see. Uh, the harpsichord sounds seems to have taken amphetamines before they walked into the studio. The qualities of simplicity, purity, and sincerity that were found in this music suggest that the performances of this repertoire might have been, I realize this is controversial in some quarters, simpler and less embellished than other 19th century practices might suggest. And some published editions uh, discussed below confirmed this. Hang on to this idea. This repertoire became established in the 19th century uh, through the publication, not of single isolated works only, but of large collections. Some were published already complete, and others were published as series under an umbrella title, mostly in France and Germany, but much wider in circulation than that. There's very little interest of anyone wanting to do this, to do this in England or Italy, for instance. The first collection of 18th century music uh, for the violin is Cartier's La du Violon from 1797, which included an anthology of 140 violin compositions from Corelli to Stamitz. And here is the title, the contents list, sorry. Uh, I hope that's uh, properly visible. I highlighted a few of these for a talk I, I gave uh, earlier this year. Corelli gets six pieces. Uh, Tartini down the page gets five. Bach gets one. Uh, Gavinius gets two, for heaven's sake, but Bach gets one. Um, the most strongly represented composers are Corelli, five, six pieces, Leclerc, five, and Tartini, five. There's only one piece by Bach, that's the C major fugue from the solo sonata in C, which is presented as a group of pieces, pièces très estimées, but with no other endorsement or explanation at all. There are no fingerings, there are no bowing marks, there are no added dynamics, there is no extra ornamentation. Cartier does give previously published ornamentation for Nardini and Corelli, and he produces a huge fold-out section giving literally dozens of possible ornaments for Tartini. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's an astonishing thing. But his additions resemble 20th century ur texts. I don't say 21st century, but 20th century ur texts, both in their accuracy and in their lack of any additional performance information. Cartier was ahead of his time, and it was to be a long time before similar anthologies appeared, but Baroque music was studied. By Yo's 1842 obituary, which is an extraordinary document which you should seek out, uh, describes how he studied with Viotti the music of Corelli, Locatelli, Tartini, Gimignani, and some Bach and Handel. He also performed older repertoire and concerts, and he described what each of these violin composers gave the qualities of the violin, different characters. Uh, I draw your attention to the second one, Touchon et Plan de Grasse, uh, under the bow of Tartini. We think of the devil's trill now, and that's certainly not touchant or full of grass, but that those are the qualities of Tartini. And you can see uh, what else he, he says about these other composers. Uh, he recommends the C major fugue of Bach again, uh, but basically as a study for good chord playing. 
And he says, uh, studying this piece alone uh, is the reason to, to learn the technique. You know, but that's all he says about it. Uh, he also says that studying Baroque repertoire uh, achieves miracles. Everything to do with technique will disappear and sentiment will reign in its place. The next substantial collection of 18th century violin music is Edouard Deldevez's Pies Divers, in two volumes. A third was devoted to opera extracts, comprising works from Lully and Corelli to Viotti and Carabini. And Deldevez stresses various things about his edition. He uses the original violin part, but he realizes the keyboard part uh, without giving the original figures. Uh, because we know more than we did then, kind of thing. And he has a nuanced approach to ornamentation. He thinks it's unlikely that they played everything. This is actually quite interesting, because it's based on an essentialist fallacy. Uh, Corelli's music is classically sinful, therefore all the ornaments must have been selectively used. It's a, a classic piece of question backing. He's cautious with ornamentation, and uh, he does go quite bonkers with his piano parts. Um, that's uh, Nardini's B-flat sonata, Adagio, uh, with Deltaves's incredibly ingenious piano part, uh, uh, which uh, sort of responds to the violin part in various ways and goes off the end of the scale of uh, extravagance, I think, in some, some ways. Uh, I'm just going to jump ahead now. Uh, the large-scale editions of these works, uh, I've put in a little timeline there. So Cartier from 1797, Jensen in 1889, and in between them, Deldevez, Allard, David, and Hubert Leonard. Uh, and I would draw attention to the fact that the majority of these people are not German. Um, so Deldevez appears about 10 years before David's Hohe Schule, and the other major French series, Allard's Les Maîtres Classiques, was also started four years before David and published over a period of 20 odd years. Uh, the publishing history of this is very complicated, but it was published in 56 parts in the period 1862 to 1883, first in France by Gérard and then by Schott. Uh, the plan was to issue four series of 50 works each over a few years, that's 200 pieces. Uh, like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the final number of pieces was considerably fewer than planned. Uh, Gérard published the series at first, and he gave a preface. He describes Allard as one of the artists who most honor the French school of violin playing, an artist of the clearest taste. Notice that. And the older repertoire, again, is presented as a corrective to modern bad taste, uh, the preface says, when the French public turns away from light, meaningless productions to seek out the pure pleasures of true art. Allard hasn't just selected the works, he's edited them for modern players by means of the tradition of which he is the faithful repository, fixing the tempo by the metronome. Uh, and doing all these other things. And the front part of each uh, episode of Allard uh, has the same observation générale for every piece, every composer. These are the rules from Lully right through to, um, well, Mozart actually. Uh, if there are no dots, you play on the string. If there are dots, you play sautillé. Staccato, which is the what we would call up bow staccato, is not, um, you know, spiccato, uh, bow biting into the string. But if there are strokes above the notes, then it's a lightly lifted bow stroke. Grace notes, he says, are very carefully marked, whether they're, you know, uh, uh, leaning or before the note. Moderate tempi in general, and metronome marks are given following what we think is the tradition, um, which is another bit of conjuring, I suppose. Uh, we're in the tradition, take my word for it. Um, sometimes there's advice for an individual work. Um, when Allard uh, talks about Porporus Sonata Number 9, he says there are too many trills, but it's good practice, and it was part of the taste of the time. With Nardini's Adagio, I think I've got this here, yeah, with Nardini's, uh, oh, this is the piece you played. Um, uh, uh, he gives both versions. He gives a, a, an ornamented version by Nardini and uh, the unornamented version. 
basically. And notice the nice, simple piano part that for me is a draft of clear, cool water compared to Deldebeth. Um, and he, he adds uh, some fingerings, as, as you can see, nothing very surprising, in fact. Um, but he does, uh, yeah, you can see what's going on there. Um, he gives contrasting advice about Bach and Tartini. Adar just talks about bow strokes in Bach, in the G minor partita, and he says the rhythm of one of the movements is very complicated. But with Tartini's sonata, Didone Abandonata, he is only concerned with emotion. And I'll let you take that in for a moment. Uh, there is one technical observation there about using the full length of the bow. Everything else is about emotion and feeling. Um, uh, expression and simplicity, fire, passion and energy, so all, all these expressions. Del Devez and Alar are easily outdone in terms of editorial intervention or reinvention by Ferdinand David, who is at pains to demonstrate the exact structure of a phrase, to create additional variations within variations, and to add embellishments, which paradoxically can be seen as in a sense, in the spirit of 18th century improvisation, although clearly maybe the spirit, but not the letter at all. He's not doing 18th century ornaments. Uh, I should point out that I was involved with examining a recent PhD from Huddersfield here uh, by a researcher, Anna Warsak. Uh, well, I can say this because she's got a PhD. Um, and we had been pursuing exactly the same line of research without any correspondence at all between us. Uh, I just want to make that point very clear. Uh, I was <laughs> mildly alarmed at one point, and I thought, no, the dates don't match up, it's fine. And she wasn't at the Birmingham Conservatoire with me three years ago, so that's, that's okay, but I just thought I'd mention that. The differences between Alar and David can be seen in this very, this is uh, the Folia theme and, very, and one variation. Uh, Alar is on top, there's almost no editorial marking there. I mean, practically nothing. David, on the other hand, can't stop fiddling with the shape of every single phrase and pair of notes. Um, and uh, that's a relatively restrained example. The whole, the whole piece uh, carries on like that. Now, David's Hohe achieved circulation in conservatoires, which was his aim. His editions were made for the benefit of students at the Leipzig Conservatoire, and students at the Royal Academy of Music in London learned them, some of them, with Soré and Santon. Uh, teachers used them for student repertoire. Joachim, Wilma, Neruda, and several other soloists played them. Auer wrote about three of David's pieces, although in his own editions and several became staples of the recital repertoire. But the sheer extent of his editorial ed editions, which has given much food for thought for students of 19th century string performance, I think we'll agree, um, uh, may have diverted attention from the more austere French approach sketched out here. I think the discussion may have concentrated on the German side of string performance, partly because it's of its perceived seriousness and ample documentation, but that's for another day. Looking sideways for a second, if we search the Hofmeister Monatsbericht, which is still down at the moment, by the way, uh, for some 18th century composers, we find some surprising results. David's editions of Corelli, Nardini, and Vivaldi from the 1860s are all the first German editions of works by any of these composers. But Tartini has a much longer history. Um, and interest in Tartini's music in the 19th century was therefore considerably greater than that of most other Baroque violin composers. I'll come to Bach in a moment. Hubert Léonard's anthology, the Ancienne École Italienne du Violon, was more specialized. It was all about double stops. So it collected a load of movements of uh, Gimignani, Corelli, Tartini, everyone, uh, full of chords, fugues mostly. Bach is not included, which is a little surprising, considering that his fugues are, by definition, full of chords. But he's not there. Uh, there are six fugues taken from the works of Tartini and fugal movements from Gimignani. He also includes Corelli's Opus 5, number 1, and his realization of Corelli's bass lines is about as restrained as Allard. He uses the detache at the point rather than spiccato, and his fingerings don't imply much portamento at all. 
there's also a large collection by Gustav Jensen, which has not attracted much attention so far from the 1880s. But that has 34 pieces with four by Gimignani, four by Tartini, including Didone, four by Corelli, three by Handel, and one by Bach. Where has Bach gone? In 1964, Friedrich Blum described how Bach's music performed, pour, poured out in a mighty river, wave upon wave, into the century of classicism and romanticism. That might have been true because composers and writers venerated Bach, but it certainly doesn't accord with the choices made by those publishing editions of string music. There's a summary of uh, some Bach publications up to about 1930. You can see that um, uh, the bulk of interest in the cello suites comes perhaps towards the end of the 19th century rather than earlier. And uh, certainly with the violin, um, there's a long gap after David, uh, and then we get uh, another bit of a gap. And then around about the end of the 19th century, going into the 20th, we get a lot more people editing uh, solo works of Bach. Um, they were played, of course, by David from concerts in the 18, from 1840 onwards, and Joachim played them in concerts from 1844. Uh, the cello suites were infrequently heard in concerts from the 1860s onwards. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip slightly over this. Uh, Lipinski's edition of the Bach violin sonatas with accompaniment stresses the, the contrapuntal nature of the music. That's an edition from um, 1841. Uh, and the difficulty of the music and the practicality of his own edition. And Lipinski's edition was reviewed as being subdued with the sublimity of Bach's spirit. Even there, we can see the elevation of Bach's music to a higher spiritual realm. The point is that Bach's status in the 19th century was primarily as a contrapuntal composer, as the absolute master of contrapuntal music. No one talks about his simplicity or his purity or anything like that. Um, skipping forward to the recording period, what do we find? A lot of Tartini, a lot of Corelli? No. I just searched a bit through Alan Kelly's uh, discography and also the discography of American historical recordings to come up with a few preliminary statistics, and they're very sketchy at the moment. But in the period up to 1930, the overwhelming majority of recordings of 18th century string music are of works by Handel, and a large proportion of these are Handel's Largo, or Ombra Mai Fu. These fade from the picture by the 1920s, at about the same time that Vivaldi starts to emerge. Chrysler played a Vivaldi concerto in 1921. René Chemet was the first to record a Vivaldi concerto in 1922. There are many recordings of Bach, including quite a lot of recordings of the air on the G string. Tartini is mostly present in his virtuosic variations on a theme of Corelli. So Tartini has become a virtuoso and Bach is the thinking musician's composer um, playing the air on the G thing, and of course the, the other works that we know quite well. Now, I'm going to play you, yeah, that's uh, a very brief uh, summary of that. <coughs> ah. Oh my God. I'll just... Um, so, uh, I'm just going to play you some bits of recordings now. Uh, Adolf Busch is very unusual here. He's recorded a piece of Corelli in 1919, and he records a piece of Tartini in 1921, and it's not the variations on a theme of Corelli. So here's Adolf Busch playing a Corelli adagio. <laughs>
here he is playing Tartini. I think this is even more beautiful. Now, for my money, that performance by Bush of Tartini is something that Bayo would have recognized quite a lot of. It is, in other words, touchant et plein de grâce. Uh, I, I don't see any problem there at all with the fact that he's using vibrato differently or that, you know, all the stuff that we talk about, you know, is probably different. <laughs> his instrument is certainly set up differently. His bow is different. None of that really matters for me because the essential qualities of that performance are as they were described in the 1830s. Um, this is rather more amusing. I made a terrible mistake the first time I heard this, and I assumed that Anton and Alma Vitek were indulging in a bit of uh, bio-inspired bowing, or even possibly Viotti, I was completely wrong, as at least one person in this room will recognize when I play it. The opening of the double concerto, I'm just going to go to the... Uh... <laughs> They're using Josef Joachim's edition, those upbow staccato bowings uh, that you heard, and every bit of crossbeat slurring that you heard, three notes and so forth and so on, uh, that's in Joachim's edition uh, of 1905. Um, but I think they're not playing it in the spirit of Josef Joachim, actually. Here is the first recording of the Folia Variations, made by the Serbian violinist Jovanovic Bratza, Jolly vigorous music, as the British musician called it. But um, uh, if we get past the horrific half the chord sound, I mean, very much of the time, obviously, but, you know. Um, but that is a straight up and down performance. Okay, it's massively overprojected and everything like that. But again, that is, I think, possibly in the spirit of Allah. Uh, and I'm, I just have a couple of remarks to make at the end of this, but I must play you this because this is one of my all-time favorite recordings, and it's of Bach. Thank mm -hmm. you.
quite incredible. Um, she just announces herself with that first note, almost just walking into the room. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, allowing for some differences like vibrato, tonal projection, and so forth, I want to suggest there's more in common between these 1920s performances and what is suggested by the 19th century sources I've looked at. A clean, unadorned approach is surely what Alain would have recognized. Bush's Tartini resonates with Bayo's Touchon et Plain de Grasse. If there's a connection between David and the Klingler Quartet through Joachim, I suggest that there's at least a connection between Alain and some other players in the early recording period. I don't mean that they were playing like Alain because they inherited his tradition. Okay. I mean that for a variety of cultural reasons, they ended up playing in a style that Allah or Bayo might have recognized. And that's different from saying that the Klingler Quartet plays in the 19th century tradition handed down to them by Joachim. It's a different approach to historiography, that stylistic developments and changes can fold back on themselves and make it look like we've come to something we've heard before. It's a bit like fashion or something. Um, uh, and I think that's, uh, for me at the moment, this is starting to intrigue me quite a lot, that these are performances which are straightforward, but not mechanically modernistic in the way that is often talked about. Now, they are clean and direct and emotionally expressive in a way that many 19th century violinists would have recognized. Thank you very much. <laughs> David has a question. Could you please, David, could you come slightly more? That's true. If I'm over here, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, George. I mean, that was an extremely thought-provoking um, exposition. I really, really enjoyed those tips as well. I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the things that, that strikes me really is that um, you know, r rather too much time is spent. <laughs> seems to me, by it, or, or hitherto, in terms of uh, performing practices dealing with sort of, you know, a kind of toolbox plumbing kind of approach to it. You know, we've become very, very hung up on the, on the sort of the, the specifics of, you know, this kind of portmanteau, that kind of grass, mm. and so on. Uh, and I think, I think, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely <laughs> can see this thesis. I, I think it's very persuasive. And I think it's, it's possibly something that, that describes a lot of, of, of what happens more generally as well. I mean, I, I felt for a long time that, that if one can, for example, listen beyond the obvious uh, aspects of, you know, this play in 1930, he's a this play in 1905 or whatever, one, one finds cultural connections, which are really quite profound. Um, and I think to a certain extent, it's, it's for me, certainly, it's almost a matter of, of, of now we have done that, now we have talked about you know, yes, everybody knows that you do a big course of mentor here and, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, now it's a matter, I think, possibly of, of sort of unteasing these, these sort of rather deeper cultural connections. Mm -hmm. I wonder equally whether there are issues here as well to do with us, because um, uh, it's quite interesting. I was examining with somebody the other day who, in spite of disavowing the, the whole kind of modernist notion of of, of historical performance being a way of doing it right or doing it wrong, uh, the phrase, oh well, you know, this was being done incorrectly, came out in conversation, and I was slightly shocked by it. Actually. <laughs> uh, and it makes me think that, you know, that, that, you know, if you scratch anybody in the <laughs> late 20th, early 21st century, we're still all sorts of, it seems to me, uh, somewhat stuck in this kind of, we've got to get it right kind of mentality. And equally, I think, in the early 20th century, maybe if you scratch all of these plays, you find uh, profound uh, evocations of, of, of a kind of 19th century romantic notion of what expressivity is. And I yes. think that was the thing that I think particularly in, in all of those bits actually, but the last one in particular no, no. comes through really powerfully. So, I mean, do, do you think that that's, that, that's a kind of end? What's the kind of future here, do you think, in terms of our uh, deepened understanding of the sort of bigger cultural mm -hmm. shifts? Yeah, you've actually answered your own question there, <laughs> because uh, it is about culture. I, I'm, I, I don't, God forgive me for saying this, I don't want to get into a discussion about vibrato 
ever again. And I don't want to talk about Portamento very much because it seems to me, and this has cropped up in some other work I'm doing that's not related to this event, but it seems to me that um, uh, if we start to look at things from a wider cultural perspective, which I, I myself started to do in a small way, um, some rather embarrassing number of years ago now, when I talked about gender studies and the cello, um, I, I still think that's a line to pursue. And I think, uh, uh, well, I don't want to go on too long, but I'm currently writing, uh, I'm giving a paper and I, I'm publishing it um, with Claire's project. And I gave a paper, I'm giving it again next year, God help me, I don't know why, um, about 19th century notions of musicality and how musicality itself is defined in the 1930s, in the 18th, in the 19th century, sorry, the 19th century. And, and it struck me when I was doing that work that I could make those definitions of musicality apply to the performance of Walton's Belshazzar's Feast that happened in Leeds Town Hall in 2008, which I was present at. Uh, it ticked a load of boxes, the skill of the performers, the, the locality, the, the fact that it was a communal thing given by the local orchestra and the local choral societies in a hall built, open by Queen Victoria, with moral, ex moral expressions written all the way around the walls that tells you basically, we are very musical people in Leeds. And that is one definition of musicality. People keep saying, this is a musical place because there's a load of stuff going on. It's as simple as that. They don't care how good it is, it's happening. There's stuff going on, there's a choir, there's an organist, whatever it might be. And that's a very small example, and I wouldn't want to press it too far, but um, where a cultural approach, uh, I, I, there must be a better word, but I can't think of one, uh, a cultural approach to performance research could make people look at things a bit differently. You know, and if I was to give a performance, well, I mean, I, Adolf Busch is doing it. Adolf Busch is giving a performance of Tartini that Bayo would have recognized and called musical, you know. Uh, and I think that's that's quite thought provoking. It also goes to the question of what is a performance and what is a piece of what is a musical work anyway. But I don't want to raise that now. No, no, we're not going there. We're not going there. But yeah, sorry, I've I've taken too much time and I arrived late, so I'm I'm condemned forever to the after darkness now. Uh, thank you, George. I just want to sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just want yeah. to ask you a final question uh, yeah. before we uh, proceed with our break because we need to set up for the uh, different mm. things. Agnes Scotty is uh, oh. uh, is uh, oh yeah yeah she is asking you a question. She says, "I enjoyed George's presentation, but I wonder how it ties with the title of the paper. Why why Bach? Why not Tartini?" Could you elaborate a little bit yes. more about the connection? Yeah, and that's a, that, that's a failure which I noticed yesterday and I thought, oh dear, well, I hope no one asked me that question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. Uh, it's been some years uh, since our paths crossed, but yeah. Um, yeah, basically, Tartini starts to be seen as a virtuoso violin composer and Bach stops being seen as primarily a contrapuntal composer and becomes seen as someone who could actually write tunes. And that's what people liked. Uh, so although that, that Bush recording is beautiful, there are, I don't know of another one like it, actually. Everyone wants to record the devil's trill, you know. <laughs> uh, but even Bayeux says that the devil's trill, the advice, he, you know, Alar, gives advice about playing the devil's trill. It's nothing about fingering, which is what I think, forgive me, I think quite a lot of violinists would like to know what the fingering might be for the devil's trill. No, it's about accenting the trills, making sure it's all clear and stuff like that. So even then he's not writing as if it's a virtuosic piece, God help us. Um, but yeah, it's to do with a, a shift in taste and a shift in perceptions of Bach and a shift in perceptions of Tartini. Um, that's basically it. Thank you, Agnes. <laughs> Thank you, George. This was wonderful. Thank you very much.